house for facilities and workplace services professionals. My name is Pascal Sundram, and I'll be sitting down with our facilities leaders to learn all about their stories, discuss their career, their impact, and how you can make an impact in the FM industry. Today's guest is John Carillo. John is highly experienced, nearly 40 years of experience in the field of facility management and corporate real estate, particularly within technology related companies. Recently retired as a director of planning, design and construction, Western region of AT&T, he successfully oversaw project management of 40 million square feet across 13 states in the Western US region and Goa. With a team of facility and pro project managers, architectural energy and engineering firms, contractors and consultancy efficiently manage capital and expense infrastructure projects amounting to 250 million annually. Wow. Prior to his tenure at AT&T, John uh, held positions in corporate real estate aircraft division at North Grumman. Throughout his career, he has displayed remarkable leadership, managed up to 1,500 FM employees and overseeing various strategic initiatives, including the construction of a missile factory, decommissioning of a nuclear reactor, the management of seismic retrofit projects in the San Francisco Bay Area. John is a respected figure in the global FM community, frequently presenting at international events, offering courseworks and courses on FM, real estate, and ISO 9001 quality processes. He is currently engaged in virtual presentations focusing on digitization technology, post-pandemic FM trends, and sustainability and resilience in the built environment. Notably, John has served as a past chair of the IFMA Global Board and presently acts as a liaison for ISO TC267. In February 2021, John was elected by the Global FM Board of Directors as the chair of Global FM, a prestigious position he holds for two-year term. Global FM, established in 2006, is a worldwide federation of member-centric organizations dedicated to advancing the field of FM. Under his leadership, Global FM has witnessed substantial growth, increasing its membership from 8 to 14 associations across different countries. John holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in architecture from California State Polytechnical University, as well as Advanced Management Certificate from Claremont University Graduate School earned in 1986. He obtained his ISO 9001 Registrar Team Certification in 1996 and was honored with the IFMA Fellowship Award in 2006. A significant contribution to the FM industry have garnered recognition from IFMA, the Association of Facilities Engineering, and the Western Construction Consumer Council. <laughs> wow, John, that's the longest and the most comprehensive bio I've ever read. Welcome to Baju Talk FM. John, let's go uh, back. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, yes. Yeah, I was going to say thank you for uh, for that opening. I've, I've been around the longest, so I, maybe that's the way I got all those accolades. <laughs> John, I think, uh, you know, 75, 80 minutes is not enough, but we'll do our best, John. Let's go back to the very beginning, John, your early life. Where were you born? And let's talk about your early life and education. Uh, well, sure. I um, Going back, uh, you know, my, my father was very artistic. He was in the construction industry. So I knew as I was approaching even high school that I wanted to get into architecture. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, you know, I took drafting classes and, and, you know, got started there, whatever offerings there were at the local high school. And, um, and then immediately after high school, I, I wanted to get into, you know, a big university. During that time frame in the actually about 1970, there were only five accredited degree universities in architecture. And uh, at that time, it was a Bachelor of Science. And four of the universities were uh, very, very expensive. Uh, I, my uh, background, I didn't, my family didn't have the wherewithal to, to send me to a big university. But one of the California uh, polytechnic schools, uh, and there's actually two that offer architecture. One is located in San Luis Obispo and the other is in Pomona, Southern California. Um, so for the first two years, I 
decided to go to a uh, community college. I went to East LA a Junior College. I majored in architecture. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I, was, I had a lot of uh, athletic skills and ability and played basketball uh, in high school. And, um, and so I, uh, right after that, and going into the community college and getting ready to, to, to leave there to go to a four-year university, or uh, I got a basketball scholarship actually at Cal Poly. So by fortune, I was, uh, Cal Poly at that time was, as I had mentioned, one of the five accredited degree universities in California. And uh, they had a statistic at that time that said one out of 10 practicing architects actually graduated from Cal Poly. I'm sure that has changed over the years. So needless to say, the coach says, would you like a scholarship at Cal Poly University here in Pomona? And I said, I, I said, there's one exception. I said, I'll for, forego the, the scholarship, but you got you got to get me uh, you've got to get me in line because there's a thousand applicants, and I think they're only <laughs> accepting seventy. And uh, you know my grades are good, but they may not be that good if they're doing that type of evaluation. And he says no. He said uh, he says you're going to come down with me to to see the dean because I really need you on the basketball team. So by good fortune, um, uh, I was able to um, you know be part of Cal Poly and continued there um, is basically a five-year architectural uh, engineering type program. So I, I graduated there in, uh, in 1975. Wow. So that's, that's how I, uh, that's my early beginnings of, uh, and I had aspirations of being an architect, mm. but I, I would imagine a little later it's this discussion of, you know, how, how did I and I and so many others end up in the world of facility management and corporate real estate. Yes, totally. Thanks, John. Thanks for sharing. John, when you were growing up, when you were young, your schools in high school, talk us through about how was it growing up in the 1960s and 1970s? Yeah, actually, um, it's quite interesting in the 1960s. Um, there were a lot of things going on uh, during the 60s, some turbulent times. Um, you know, starting early in the decade, uh, we, we had the, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and then there we, we had uh, some civil rights activities going on in the, the mid-60s, and of course the Vietnam War. So um, there, there were, I would say there were some radical, those were yet radical years for the youngsters. Uh, I remember my parents saying during that time frame, uh, and, and I did this uh, comparison to my kids, you know, now they're older now, but I, I did the comparison of, uh, you know, they're saying, hey, this world, the, the times today is it's never been this bad. And, and I, I, I look back and I said, yeah, you know, history kind of recycles itself and there's ups and downs and, you know, this too shall pass. And, and so, you know, I relate to them, my upbringing and, um, of course, you know, they're saying, oh, no, the world's divided. We have, you know, we're on the verge of war. And, and so I, I, I encourage them to, to, you know, hold steadfast and, and uh, we'll all get through this together. But at that time, it was very turbulent, as I'd mentioned with you, mm. um, being a youngster and every Friday and, you know, doing the drill of getting underneath the desk for because of the nuke clear scare yes. and then the, the Vietnam War uh, which was later in the 60s and I was fortunate uh, I, I was there for the draft but uh, at that time I was I did the birthday draft and and I wasn't selected but you know I had a lot of friends that uh, didn't do so well um, so yeah times were, were turbulent um, but uh, we, we made it through that decade totally totally thank you thank you John John, architecture in 1975 to architecture now is totally different, right? What were you studying in architecture in Calpol? And over the years, how did you adapt yourself in real estate? How, how, how did the grounding help you? You know, uh, yeah, I, first I, I wanna say that, uh, you know, as, as a youngster, mm -hmm. um, I was, uh, I think that people, uh, a lot of parents want to know how well you're going to do, and, and 
they'll do testing on you or you know they they want you to, to to be a doctor or a lawyer and of course you have to possess a lot of great skills and and being able to to talk and know the, the king's english so to speak and spelling and whatnot but i was more of a very spatial person and uh and so to me uh drawing and being able to to to, to relate how things progress i mean i I found myself in high school, you know, um, being able to understand the, the process of, you know, how do you uh, come up with a concept, you know, form follows function, flow it out, design it, build it, and do it, you know, graphically. So I think to me, um, that was a skill that I had. And, and later, uh, you know, my, my English and, and spelling, and, you know, I was more of a latent learner, and that came along a little bit later. So there were, you know, early struggles with that, but um, I think architecture was, I was best suited for architecture. And uh, the, the one thing I think uh, you, know, you hear a lot about people, how do you get into facility management of corporate real estate? And, and you know, for the exception of the last 20 years was there, there are accredited degree programs across the world at uh, various locations where you can get a, a college degree or uh, a master's even a doctor degree in fm mm -hmm. uh, that number is quite small so at like most of us um, you know we got in with either a technical degree or some experience in, in facilities management or corporate real estate so um when i got out of college got married and uh, being a draftsman and um do, doing redlining and whatnot for an architectural office. And also I worked for electrical engineer uh, for about six months each. And, you know, after about a year, uh, you know, in the mid seventies, extreme high interest rates, their, their uh, economy wasn't doing quite well. And so uh, me and my wife decided, well, she says, uh, John, you know, I know you want to be an architect, but we got to pay the bills. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we lived out in the Valley area and she said, hey, there's there, there's some openings uh, in the, at the General Dynamics, which is an aerospace company. Mm -hmm. It was the first aerospace company I worked for. And uh, so she said, why don't you apply there? And I thought, you know, I don't think there's any architectural pro, uh, positions there, but I did sign up or I did have an interview and uh, they actually offered me a position as an industrial engineer or I could specify equipment. There was a plan engineering department at that time, not known as facility management, but it acted like facilities management. We all know that during the 70s or you know, through the millennium there uh, until the, uh, the year 2000, that facilities management, that title facility management really was a compilation of a lot of different disciplines that were split up you know, earlier in, uh, or later in the 1900s. Uh, and where finance came together and planning came together, uh, engineering, construction, maintenance, et cetera. So um, they said, hey, you know, you got a degree and it looks like you can fit here. You want to be an industrial engineer? And I said, sure. So I immediately got in and, and I was doing some kind of a specification um, for some of the infrastructure equipment that was needed, you know, major pieces of air conditioning equipment and uh, infrastructure. And, and then uh, they, they soon figured out that, you know, hey, we have some retrofits going on here uh, and you have an architectural background. So, um, you know, I got in that way to, of, of showing what I could do as, as an architect fitting in as an industrial engineer. And that particular time during the, uh, the late 1970s, about 1976 to uh, 1981, uh, General Dynamics there in Southern California won the best award for plan engineering. Wow. And of course, at that time, there wasn't really any recognition of facilities management. Uh, I think the, the only organization that was around and I did join, join them was the Association of Plan Engineers. Uh, plan engineers, you know, I think 30 years later, then be formally became AFE, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, the Engineering Facility Management Association. Um, 
So the, the one thing that really stuck out for me after a couple of years was uh, the, they put me into doing strategic planning. And I think because of my architectural background, mm -hmm. I was able to see the big picture. Uh, I, I could see what was needed for the future. And in aerospace, uh, it, it was primarily, you know, how do we build a product? It's primarily manufacturing. Yes, there's, you know, we at that time we had some preliminary or some some aging equipment called that data centers, but uh, uh, there was technology there, and we would hire lots of people. And so, I would put plans together: one year, three year, five year, ten year strategic plans uh, to, to look at whatever the upside or downside of the products being built in aerospace and put those strategic plans together, cost it out. And then uh, if need be, you know, if some program, uh, we want to program in aerospace, then we would implement, the, we would develop the plan to implement. So that's really uh, my, my first big break of mm -hmm. uh, really doing planning, even though we were still considered planning engineering at that time. And then during the, uh, the decades of the 80s and 90s, then a lot of facility management organizations did structure themselves to be called facility management or capital asset and expense program or corporate real estate facilities. And so um, I was there kind of in the beginning as a lot of that took place, the formulation of the formal title of facility management organization. Wow, starting from CalPol, uh, doing architecture, moving into engineering design and uh, structure. I mean, like, that's an amazing grounding, general dynamics. And uh, talk us through your career all the way into at and and managing this, I don't know, 4 million, 40 million square feet worth of uh, buildings. Just talk us through about how you progressed yourself over the yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, uh, you know. Yeah, let me, uh, I'll do that. Uh, I, I do have to say that um, um, it was important for me and in, in going way back in the day in the 70s um, with the development of facility management in IFMA back in, you know, 19, uh, 1980 mm. uh, and other types of organization. You know, I did join IFMA in 1982 or 83, I should say, I've been there for, there 40, uh, 40 years, but I was grappling for a lot of information, how to get organized and, and how do you train facility managers? Because at the time we, we were a, a group of people that came from finance and a group of people that you know came from maintenance and a group of people that maybe had some technical skills. Uh, so that was the, the first real challenge for me and the organizations and I was fortunate to, to manage the large organizations as I grew from General Dynamics to Northrop Corporation, uh, which was aerospace, and then ultimately into telecommunications uh, with AT&T. So that, that was the first order business where I did work with um, uh, BOMA, or actually the BOMA Institute back in the 1980s to, to create um, a facility management program, similar to various certifications that today many of the FM associations uh, provide, uh, equivalent to a CFM or equivalent to RFA if, you know, if it's BOMA. And there are other programs. Cornet has real estate type programs and certifications. So I was able to uh, pioneer, so to speak, uh, one of the very first uh, FM. Um, it, it, was, it was a the certification, but it, you know, it was something that um, was put together from by some very smart people. But at that time, we, you know, things weren't certified like they are today. Uh, but in any event, um, I then got more involved with uh, the FM organization and, and uh, got involved with uh, BOMA and Cornet and, and FMA to, you know, um, to learn from others. Uh, and, and of course, the one interesting thing about industry is you can not only get into facility management as a whole to understand the experiences of, of other companies or corporations, but 
you can dial into what's, you know, uh, to the industry that you're in. If you're in your manufacturing, if you're in the banking, if you're in the building of museums, whatever the case might be, there's opportunity to learn there. So it, it's always been a continual learning process for me. Um, I was very fortunate also to um, be part of uh, the continual process improvement uh, program, uh, you know, to, a total quality program, which started uh, a big push in the 80s. And, um, and then as I transitioned into telecommunications in the 90s, we embarked upon Malcolm Bauer's criteria to, to, uh, to take a look at how you run an efficient organization. But more importantly, we registered with ISO 9001, yes. which really takes a, look, takes a look at your total operation from people, process, place, if you will, systems, policies, and procedures. And it's more of a plan, do, check, act, where it, it allows you to be consistent with your delivery. But more importantly, dial in to uh, you know, the demand organization or your clients uh, for client satisfaction. So I, I was, uh, to, to answer your question, making the transition to, uh, from General Dynamics to a much larger organization, uh, I did that in 1981. Um, I, after a couple of years, I went in a strategic plan in a couple of years, then I ran the aircraft division for Northrop Corporation at that time, that was before they merged with Grumman. And uh, my portfolio was quite quite large. And uh, we, uh, we built airplanes and missiles and things like that, uh, which is always fascinating, the technology. Uh, but it was, it was a large portfolio. I think at that time it was probably 10 to 12 million square feet, maybe a hundred million dollars in um, you know, keeping up with with retrofitting the buildings and the infrastructure equipment maintenance, the total cost. Um, so it was at that time during the, the 80s that uh, productivity was a big issue with office space. And so we retrofitted all of our office space and you know we had thousands of, of people there. And so we transitioned to furniture systems, you know, could be one of the, the big ones like Herman Miller or Steelcase, et cetera. They're, four or five manufacturers at that time. Uh, and it was important and, and it was about productivity. And, you know, ever since then, and that's the theme, you know, if we wind the clock forward 30, 40 years, it's about productivity. Yes. But that, that was the early beginnings uh, with uh, uh, furniture systems. You took a look at the flow. You, you took a look at providing uh, an environment for those people that was, was uh, aesthetically nice. And at the same time, very productive, you know, the type of workspace that they worked in. Um, so that was, that seemed to be the, the big driver, uh, you know, during the 80s is the office workspace versus the old traditional bullpens that you see <laughs> in some of the old photos where people are out in desk in big areas and it's noisy and it's busy. Um, so that was a big transition in facility management at that time. Um, but I had a, a number of large projects. I've um, I built a missile factory in uh, in the, the southern states, middle of Georgia, uh, and I think in your intro there, I had a, a opportunity. I, actually, before that, I we uh, in building um, the the product line of aircraft parts and uh, and other things that we did. Um, with long range ballistic intercontinental missiles. And there were some unique um, applications of technology and machinery and, and such. So uh, it was important for us to come up with a, an excellent preventive maintenance program yes. in, in terms of keeping the reliability of all your machines operating. So that was another big factor that we embarked upon, created a preventive maintenance program that uh, we were able to sometimes uh, keep good records and come up with corrective maintenance, which by now is something that is passe. To now, it's it's more than preventative. It's not only corrective; it's predictive because mm -hmm. of the technology, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Sure. But during that time frame, uh, it, you know, it was quality management, 
and and doing the things that you're you need to do to enhance the useful life of your infrastructure equipment. So um, we also had a, a large. Uh, we use a lot of chemicals in manufacturing parts, and so from a, an environmental standpoint, there's a lot of rigor on air quality, ground quality, uh, uh, with your equipment. And, and quite a transition for us because, you know, you, you heard of the horror stories back in the 80s with uh, with uh, orga volatile organic compound leak <laughs> spewing in the air or leaking into the groundwater. That was a big drive, uh, not only for aerospace, but that was a big drive across the United States at that time to be compliant. And, um, and of course, you know, there was the big environmental push at that time. Um, so that's how various green and lead organizations developed. And again, it was another learning process for facility management. So now we're getting into the environment and, uh, you know, we need to understand and that's part, part of our job responsibility. So I, I, you know, I, I can, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm getting too detailed with uh, no, no, trying okay, to answer your question. It's fascinating, John. How, uh, how we you know what, how we kind of you know brought in how you evolved when the industry was evolving in itself, and also how you took more and more wider, bigger responsibilities. At the same time, you also you know nicely laid uh, how uh, the processes like ISO preventative maintenance schemes also started to evolve productivity. That's that's beautiful. So thank you for sharing. So these special projects that we're talking about, like building a missile factory, decommissioning a nuclear reactor, large seismic retrofit, et cetera, uh, I'm, I'm sure they are memorable for you. How was it managing like 1,500 people and 20,000 buildings, et cetera, Sean? Yeah, creating a preventative maintenance program for 20,000 buildings, and that, that was across the United States uh, at the time for AT&T. And a lot, a lot of those... Were, were smaller locations where, you know, we had equipment on uh, mountaintops and, and mm. towers, et cetera. Um, but uh, the, the company I worked for, AT&T, at one time was, the, actually, I think, actually the third largest portfolio in the United States. So it was important for us to stay on top of uh, the operational costs and reliability of our, our equipment. Um, so... Yeah, we had many, many programs like that. I, um, I, I've managed large portfolios and large numbers of individuals. And so, uh, you know, it was prudent for me to, to provide them with updating their skill set on a continual basis. Mm. As I had mentioned, not all of us, you know, may have a technical degree. I mean, nowadays we, we have facility managers that have a, an FM degree and there's some pretty smart individuals. I've been to some of those universities and, and the master degree programs talking to those individuals. And it's like, wow, what took me 20 years, you know, you, you're, 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 you're off and running, but, but then they said, well, what, what's new for facility management? And then I get into the world of, uh, you know, digitization and sustainability and they're, they're kind of scratching their head a little bit. Well, we've heard a little bit about that. Yes. And so, you, you know, when you get into facility management, you look at it as, and, and there may be 10, 11, 12, 13 core competencies, depending on, the FM association across the world that have developed, you know, a certification mm. that you can pick up. Um, but our skill set, especially in the last decade, or you know, it's exponential from decade to decade. Technology takes us to higher places that we've we've never been, mm. and so to, to that extent, it's important that whenever you graduate, or even today, if you're new into the workplace, you have to continue continually hone in those skills and um and it needs to be specific to your industry mm. um you know some industries rely on uh, now let me let me go back a little bit about 85 percent of all companies across the world mm. have some sort of digitization uh programming that's used within their, their, their business portfolio. And you know, that disseminates out to facility management. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're a facility manager that uh, is looking into, 
get involved with with uh, it's some, something that's more sophisticated with a CAFM system or a CMMS system or a BMS system. system mm -hmm. uh, you need to start off with the basics, and then you can roll from there because digitization is taking it to to another level. But it's a continual process to to learn to learn and grow, and you really need first to understand your industry. And so that was something that was important to me mm -hmm. and important to my team. Mm. So if you manage people, you want to make sure that you're working with them on their skill set, regardless of whether they have a degree or not, regardless of their background and their skill set. Because uh, we know, know in the, the world of facility management, you know, we're, we do a lot of different things. There, there's no two days that are the same. <laughs> and when I've talked to, to many high school students and college students, you know, I'll say that and then I'll tell them about you know, doing seismic retrofit project projects in San Francisco yes. and building a missile factory and decommissioning a nuclear reactor, which took three and a half years to do. And yes. People go, facility managers do that? Facility <laughs> managers, you know, do it all. <laughs> Think about a company. When, yeah. they're, when they're developed and they get on site, you need a facility manager. If, you know, they grow, you need a facility manager organization. And, um, mm -hmm. and if they merge, you merge facility management organizations. So you're from there from beginning to end. So it's a very exciting industry. Totally, totally. Thank you, John. John, you have seen 40 years of how FM evolved, John. So that, that gives you a very good idea about what could be the future of facilities management. What do you think are the key trends, technologies, or anything that's happening now? And how do you think it's going to shape the future? Yeah, I, you know, uh, in the last couple of years after, you know, well, actually, let's go back a couple of years with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we've learned a lot of things about the pandemic. And uh, I think what we really learned is what a safe environment uh, looks needs to look like, especially mm -hmm. with the parameters of, of air quality and all the things that go into distancing of people because of the pandemic and future pandemics. So a lot of good things came out of that. Um, it's kind of cyclical. I mean, you know, when you look at facilities management 100 years ago with the Spanish flu and whatnot, you know, there were changes made with the sanitation and the infrastructure equipment, you know, from a rural perspective. And today, um, we, we've learned a lot about you can operate uh, from home. You can operate remotely. Uh, that's not going to necessarily be the way it's it's going to go, but we've learned that it's a hybrid world. We mm -hmm. also learned that if you do a hybrid world and you you work remotely, security is a big issue. And many companies two years ago weren't ready for that. Uh, many co companies weren't ready to bring people back when they were able to. So again, it was a learning process for the industry, working with the professionals like Ashray when it comes to mechanical equipment or working with designers to, you know, do the right spatial distancing and working with uh, various uh, programmers um, to, to monitor the flow of people to make sure it's a safe environment. So we've learned a lot from that, but mm. you know, we've, we've, we've kicked it up a notch. The world now is, there's a lot of important things going on. I mean, maybe three areas that I can, can look at that I think are going to be with us for a while is sustainability and resilience. And resilience uh, is something that uh, is going to be important for you to continue to operate with the diversity of whether it's what a weather pattern, it's mm. an emergency. So, you know, the way we look at Developing a business plan is a lot different than it was in the past. The risk management assessment that goes into it, uh, where you live, and assessing how you're going to operate. Um, just from a corporate standpoint, what's also very interesting uh, is now that people are coming back to work, and a lot of people don't want to come back to work, and, uh, and I know that's an issue across the world because uh, in some cases they have proven that people um, – can be just as efficient, if not more, mm. you know, mm. by working, by being flexible. And so many corporations said, you know what, we're spending a lot of money 
Mm. And this would probably be particularly true with, uh, with the international fortune companies that are now growing leaps and bounds uh, across the world that, you know, we can get talent from anywhere. Yes. We, we can be more prudent uh, of, of bringing the work to the talent instead of the talent to us. We can save on operational costs. We can save on, on, on commute costs. We're more flexible. And, and, and as a result, it's better for the environment. It takes more cars off the road. Uh, you know, it, it provides for a healthy environment. Uh, you know, we may need to create satellite areas, you know, where people do come to work a couple of times a week. But by and large, they're at home. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, that really helps with the, the home life, if you will. I think up until two years ago, uh, there was a study done that said the stress level uh, across the world is at the highest it's ever been because people are working longer and harder hours. And so I, I think what we've learned from the pandemic is maybe a hybrid of, of how we can work and be more flexible. So companies are being much more flexible. Instead of saying, you're coming to work eight five, I want to see butts and seats. I, I, the, the, that era has, is, is, it's different. Now it's about the business. And the business today that incorporates in their sustainability programs, they incorporate uh, how we can continue to improve our environment, but do it at work as well. Reduce greenhouse gases, uh, reduce your carbon footprint, come up with best practice, use renewable energy. Mm. Then at the end of the day, your, your company within your industry becomes more efficient, more effective, and now it's something that many companies across the world are looking across because looking at is because technology is allowing them to be much more prudent, much more effective. Therefore, um, the business perspective is, is positive. You know, they're, they're able to, 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 to gain on the competition. Mm. And so to that end, I think sustainability is, is, a, is a key part of that, of that whole process. Now, I know many companies and corporations uh, across the world and early in the United States in the 70s, they, they developed a corporate social responsibility platform. And this is where, you know, we're, we're going to be green and we're going to use renewable energy and, 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 and that's being a good corporate citizen. But now it's, that's progressed. And actually the facility management organization actually created the platform of um, ESG, which is the Environmental Social Governance Program, it's a template that facility managers need to use with, with their company's strategic plans. Yes. And, and, and what that does is it allows you to make the assessment, look at the return on investment, look how you're going to reduce operational costs or become more efficient. Uh, but at the same time, you're helping helping the environment. So I, I think a lot of facility managers today uh, aren't aware of that template, the ES the, the ESG G template that's that came out in the late '80s, and it, it should be used as you develop your co corporate social responsibility programs. And, and because a lot of the things that we're, we're doing, it's about a sustainable future. And as I'd mentioned, it's about renewable energy. It's about reducing greenhouses. It's about recycle. Uh, it, 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 it takes effect on constructability, where uh, constructability is not, you don't build everything on site. You, you come up with ways to do modular construction, bring it on site, being more efficient, being more effective. Yes. And reusing or recycling existing buildings. So a lot of people are saying, hey, you know what? You're, you're putting a, a whole new process in there, tear down this old building, uh, but you, you can reuse it and you can rebuild it. And at the end of the day, actually save energy by going through the whole, whole reuse, recycle, the reduce the waste, uh, because um, you know, new construction uh, contributes to uh, you know, pollution. Um, and then the, the other part of that, which I think is extremely important, um, whatever your beliefs are on climate change or global warming, 
is it's warming up. It's cooling down. We're having, I mean, this is across the world. We're having more radical storms and hurricanes and cyclones and things like that that we need to pay attention to. So the part of sustainability is being resilient, protecting your, your operation uh, through the course of a storm, uh, through the course of evacuation because there's a bomb scare or through, uh, you know, um, it's just your, your facility is destroyed by, by fire. How are you going to continue to operate uh, as a facility manager? And so a lot of those um, business continuity plans are, are very important. And along with that comes with um, you can't rely on on the grid for everything necessarily, for power, uh, for for water. Sometimes it's it, it's prudent upon yourself to come up with those backup procedures and plans yeah. to allow your 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 facility to operate during a hurricane or a flood or or you know whatever whatever the mis, mishap might be. So there, there's a term called hardening of your facilities. And that goes along with resilience, which is, you know, alternate source of energy. A, a perfect example is the a, a, a telephone company I worked for had a presence there in, uh, in Costa Rica. And, and uh, a big hurricane came through, knocked everything out, knocked out all the utilities, knocked out all the communications. And it took months bef before it came back. Mm -hmm. So many of the companies over there are, are, made an investment of their own hardened facilities to generate you know, energy or to generate uh, emergency type of communications uh, and, and harden their facilities. Um, so uh, you know, there's a lot to developing a, a business plan, mm -hmm. which is really now called a business continuity and emergency plan. Mm -hmm. And it takes into to account uh, you know, the life of uh, what you plan to do to stay you know, within that region or then within that building. Yes. Thank you, John. What a, what a, I mean, like what a, again, you, you, you are talking it from your experience and how uh, realistic the threat is and how um, the industry is coming together and, uh, and also how from your experience, how certain parts are, are actually, they have been doing it for some time already. Thank you, John. That's, that's very useful. So now, I think we have uh, the second part of the podcast. Let's just talk about, in addition to your experience, you already touched about continuous improvement and uh, and also your association very early on with IFMA and stuff. Talk us in the next two or three minutes about why did you join IFMA? Talk us about the IFMA journey and all the way into not just joining IFMA as a member, but you're also being the global chair of IFMA. Talk us through the overall about your IFMA journey and your key initiatives friends and all yeah the yeah you know um when you get in the workplace i, I want to go back to the basic of you know you get your first job mm. and you get to know your way around and you see the players and you see the jobs and, and many people go god i like to do what he does or mm. you know i want to grow but but you know that, that looks like it's too hard of a job so as a facility manager and on this is where if will come in uh, they'd say, hey, John, why don't you take on this project? And it may be not the greatest project. You know, there may be a lot of obstacles. And it, it, it's really, it, it's, it's your mindset, your attitude of, you know what? I'll take this job. I know it's difficult and I'm going to make the very best of it. So you have to have the right frame, framework for you know, the, the, uh, the mindset to say, I may not have the tools or the wherewithal, but I got to go get them. And that's, that's where IFMA came uh, for me. I'm now there were other organizations for, in construction, uh, as you had mentioned, WCCC, which is construction, and uh, other, other um, technical skills that you needed. That you go get it. You go learn. You, you bring it in-house. And, and so as you gain these, this skill set and these tools, uh, and you, you're working in a place with other facility managers just like you, uh, and you have the tools, it, it helps you to get ahead. I mean, I have to say that uh, uh, being involved with the Facility Management Association, not just SIFMA, but other organizations, is really key. 
uh, you know, it's not the world of, uh, of being a lawyer or, um, you know, or a doctor where that whole profession is, is this is where you go. This is where you, you get a license. This is where you get certification and you're off and running. It's not that way with facility management because we're 11, 10, 11, 12 different core competencies. We, you know, we're involved with all kinds of activities from energy conservation to uh, portfolio management, working with brokers and real estate agents. And, and so to, to that end, um, if you do get a certification, that's going to help you as you progress in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in your lifetime, you know, through, through your profession, you're going to wear a multitude of hats. So, so that's where certifications are important. So that I got involved with IFMA that way. The, the other thing too, it, it helped me with, with a lot of my leadership skills. And as such, I got involved with the, the local chapters early on and, and uh, it helped me and I wanted to help others. And, um, and I'm, even though I'm retired, I'm still helping a lot of others, uh, which, which was, you know, my passion of give back to, based on your success and your career, help others along, because uh, it makes the industry better, better and stronger. So that was the, the, really the rationalization to get involved with IFMA. Now, once you get involved with IFMA, or you get involved with others, there's other great associations across the world. And Global FM is made up of, you know, 14 or 15 associations across the world, which for the last two and a half years, I've had opportunity to, to interact with them. You learn a lot from them and, and you learn best practices and you share. So from a global perspective, it's more than just being a facility manager, working for a, a, in a certain location in a certain city where you get involved with the chapter. So it's continuous, you know, from, from top to bottom. Um, so that that's how I got started, and uh, I, you know I progressed through the ladders over time. Got involved with a lot of a lot of other activities, and I was fortunate enough for my company to allow me to, to participate. And they did because the value I bring back, I, I bring back that value to, to talk about. Hey, these are technological things that are going on, and it, it's not just about digitization technology in the last couple two three years. But we've had a lot of technology mm. going back to, to the 70s, the, particularly the 80s in connectivity with fiber optics. You know, that, now back then it was 3G, 4G, and fiber optics is relatively new. Um, and, and same thing with asset management. We would develop, uh, you know, there were CAFM programs, which turned into BIMs and IMMS programs. Uh, Property management, if you're involved in property management, the, the first big system was CMMS, which has now turned into you know, a, a building uh, management system or, or a building automation system. And now that has progressed because of technology. Something that also came out in the 90s was an EMS system because of the environment, sustainability environment. That's also, that's also advanced in the last, especially the last seven years, because of digitization. So the thing about digitization today, and, and you, hear, you hear a lot of people talking about uh, twin technology, an enterprise building management system, and circular economy, and you know, big data. And, and, and it's kind of like, I just want to program based on where I'm at and if I don't have a good BMS system, I need to get one. If I do have a good BMS system, I want to take it to the next level. Mm. Um, so I really think that that's going to be a very huge opportunity for facility managers to get their arms around. It's just, it's, there's not a lot of classes you walk into that. And because again, you know, we're involved with a, a myriad of whether it's construction or property management, project management. Uh, environmental, uh, you know, sustainability. Um, there's a lot of technology that is uh, will pertain to um, the, whether you get a smart system, whether you you come in with the Internet of Things, uh, and what's when it's when is it appropriate to use artificial intelligence? Those are or machine learning. Those are big words they throw around. Someone says, "Hey, I want to go from here to there," and uh, you know, 
as they say in the world of digitization, you can't measure all the dots until you find the dots. So you use a facility manager, you got to understand what is it that you want to improve instead of just bringing in consultants to say, make this environment better. Okay. You really got to understand where you're going. Mm. Yes, John. I mean, what a. So I know I'm. I'm kind of. I'm kind of jumping around. You know, in terms of how <laughs> I got in this industry of of, of IFMA and stuff. But you know, it's all kind of interrelated, uh, oh, and yes. it's going to be exciting tomorrow for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, John. Global FM. Talk about Global FM and. Uh, you as the global chair now talk us about the 14 organizations uh, who have joined in and collectively how we are going to help to shape the future of FM globally. Sure, sure. Uh, in, in 2006, uh, Global FM was, was founded by three of the larger associations, which was, uh, it used to be called BIFM, now it's IWFM, FMA, which is FM Australia, and IFMA. And, and, and they had the vision to say, let's create an association for associations. It's member centric and we provide the value and education and uh, share leadership skills and best practices with each other across the world. So it started off as a group of small, a small organization. Today there's uh, roughly 14, soon to be 15 associations from around the world. Uh, alphabetically, I have them here uh, as Aberfact from Brazil, Apafam from Panama, ACFM from Catalonia and Spain, the Egyptian Association, uh, the Nigerian Association, uh, the Saudi Facility Management Association, Turkey Association, Turkey, Turkey Facility Management, SAFMA, which is South Africa. Uh, Facility Management Association, MIFMA, which is the Middle East Association out of Dubai. I had mentioned IWFM, which is headquartered there in Great Britain. IFMA, which is headquartered in Houston. Uh, we have the Hungarian Facility Management Association um, and um, uh, FMANS, which is from New Zealand and um, in Australia. So we're, we're an organization that, that is member centric. We, we, we share and provide leadership skills with each other. We're, we're acting as a single unity organization to, to share knowledge and further understanding for the advancement of the FM uh, industry, yes. which is more than just the practitioner. The mm -hmm. FM industry, the community is about supply chain. It's about the tertiary set of vendors that you utilize. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, again, I'm going to talk a little bit about digitization, but that's where digitization comes in to make those players uh, that subcontractors and consultants and, and, and that, that work for you much more proficient and they're automated and you know where their services are coming from and you know the, the pricing and the quality that, that all of that brings. So, so to that point, that, that's what we're grappling now of what, what is the process or, you know, what's your best practice within your region, your country, mm -hmm. of how you disseminate uh, education or best practices. And we learn from each other on, you know, during the, uh, we, we greatly learn from each other uh, during, during the, the pandemic. We can't have conferences. What do we do? You know, the world's coming to an end. We can't meet in person. We've always done that our entire life. Uh, but there, we found a way to do it, a podcast and, and virtual. And of course, everyone was glad when we, we finally all got together this, this last year. Yes. Uh, and so it's an organization made up of, uh, you know, uh, some great organizations that we collaborate with. Now, we also collaborate. There's an organization called EuroFM. Mm. And EuroFM is, is made up of some of the associations that are part of Global, but they're also made up of others within the community of FM, they partner with uh, other than member centric associations where they create ambassadors, uh, again, to promote their industry. Just mm -hmm. recently in the last couple of years, a new association came about, which is the Africa Management Association. Uh, one of the chairs uh, was a chair for 
Egypt, uh, you know, he's part, he's involved with that. So they're trying to, to unite many of the African nations to, again, share best practices. So if you're, you're in that uh, part of the world, uh, you know, pay attention to that. And then there's another group um, uh, called LATAM. It's a Latin American group. And it, you know, really their, their, their closeness is because of language. Many of the Latin countries or Spanish speaking countries, um, um, they're not quite as diverse as speaking, uh, you know, the English language or others. So they, uh, and Panama is part of our association and they're very, very heavily involved with LATAM. So I, I think when you think about Global FM, you think, oh, that's where everything comes together. It doesn't necessarily. I mean, mm-hmm. and we, we share with each other uh, because it's at the end of the day, where's the value go? The value goes to our facility manager. Mm. And, and, and so if, if you're involved with an association that, you know, is, they're not into sharing or using best practices or saying, Hey, you know, you ought to get a certification over here or over there. Cause we don't have it. They're not, it's, it's, they're not serving, you know, their, their members appropriately. Uh, I'm not saying that anybody is, but mm. I'm saying that we should be much more open than maybe we were a couple of decades ago about yeah. competing with each other. Yes. Many of the FM associations would compete with each other. Mm. So that's kind of a nutshell what uh, Global Global FM is about. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you. I think uh, as we evolved together, when we had a pandemic, when there's a global challenge, I mean, like that's where competition moves away and collaboration kicked in. And, and it's quite glad that uh, right. more, more and more collaboration is now happening across the globe. And uh, we, are, we are bringing in some industry best practices, but at the same time, we are also looking into regional nuances uh, within this industry bodies. That's great. Wish you and everybody in Global FM all the success. So uh, we talked a lot about professional careers, John, but there is a lot more to <laughs> talk us through about your hobbies and interests and what, tell us three things not many people know about you. Uh, there's a lot of things. <laughs> well, um, the, the one thing I've been doing for the last 20 years and I help people, I do ancestry research and uh, I, I've helped uh, a lot of people. I, I'm, I'm, I don't do it uh, professionally, though, you know, I'm, I'm probably more advanced in, in a lot of people and being able to help people research. Uh, you know, you can use a lot of websites and know where to go. Uh, depending on where we're at across the world. So I, I've been able to successfully for, for people to say, hey, I want to find my ancestry and I'll, I'll take them back two or three generations uh, with empirical data. So, uh, you know, you, you, you want to know who you are and where you came from. I mean, I, I'm, I'm what you would call, uh, I don't know if everyone knows the expression, uh, you know, the Heinz ketchup, you know, I'm a Heinz 23, you know, so I'm, I'm a lot of different nationalities. And to me, it was it was important to, to understand about myself, but uh, I also do share the, the process of, you know, how do you, how do you find more about your, your family? That seems to be, you know, going back 50 years ago, coin collecting or stamp collecting was a big hobby, but now they're saying ancestry research is becoming probably the biggest hobby in the world. So that, that's one thing that um, I still do when I, I have spare time. Um, there was a couple of years I really got involved uh, with uh, cosmology and astrophysics. <laughs> and that, that's the study of the Big Bang and, and the stars. And uh, what, what always fascinated me was uh, the universe, it's, it's evolving and it's moving. And it's not, it's, you know, it's not 3D, 4D, it's a multitude of facets. And when you study the concepts from, you know, relative, the relativity from Albert Einstein and a few others, uh, it's just fascinating me that what you see in the sky is either long gone or it's located somewhere else um, because of relativity um, with time. And um, so, so in any event, I, uh, 
I'd have a lot of dialogue with my uncle who was kind of a mathematician at one time. So there was a period, a couple of years where I got heavily in, involved with that. My, my father uh, you know, used, had a big telescope and look at the stars. So um, that's kind of been a second hobby of mine, though I, I haven't been so involved with it uh, at this moment. And, and my third hobby right now is as I retired a few years ago, is I, I live out in uh, the Valley area, uh, just east of San Francisco and south of Sacramento, kind of in the wine country. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm becoming a farmer now, so to speak. Um, <laughs> I don't have any livestock, but you know, I got a tractor and I'm taking care of five acres and I got a pond on the side and it's beautifully landscaped. And, and so now, uh, you know, um, it's a destination for all my family comes together now because there's a lots lots to do out here so so that's my new hobby so those are probably three of my biggest hobbies i mean i when i was a young kid i used to catch rattlesnakes uh, i you know i learned to fly airplanes so I, i've had a lot of different uh, opportunities in my life <laughs> wow john i think we, we might need a special episode to capture all these things but uh, thank you <laughs> thank you for chatting <laughs> Uh, John, I think, you know, let's just lose it now because I know 40 years, you know, so many, so many stuff again, uh, let alone a very successful professional career, but going to the top, not just on IFMA, uh, but also on Global FM, AFE, you name it, WCC, and also so many other initiatives that you do. So these are fun and random questions. There is no right or wrong answer. Whatever comes in your mind, that is the answer. Shall we begin? Say that again, sure. Yes, it's fun and random questions around uh, John. So there is no right or wrong answers. So whatever comes in your mind, let's just go with that. Yeah. Oh, that that's fun. <laughs> yes. Or or just anything in general. <laughs> it's it, it's it, it's just random questions, John. So let's just talk about it. What's your favorite game, and why? Oh. Um, actually, uh, it would be chess, the game of chess. Yeah. So my, uh, I was for, I, again, I know my, my father used to be in chess clubs ever since I can remember. So probably at the age of four, I learned how to play chess and, uh, it's, it's a strategic game. It's, it's, um, when you can think, you know, the, uh, to be the grand champion and all that, you know, as you get into the world of chess, mm. if you can articulate seven moves ahead and counter the seven moves ahead from the opponent, uh, you know, and most of us can barely think one or two moves ahead. Mm. But uh, to me, it's very fascinating. Um, and I, I would imagine that uh, the people with the highest IQs are the grand champions. But uh, to me, that was that was um, very challenging. Again, it's almost like no two moves were liked. So uh, that, that was fun for me, even though, you know, it, it uses brain power and sometimes you can get serious, but, uh, but I'll tell you what, it's a distraction. If you can get, if you can have a distraction like that and you get away, you, you don't, you don't think about anything else, <laughs> then, you know, you feel, you feel good about it. <laughs> totally, totally. What, what, that's a perfect distraction for, for us to have. It's nice. So <laughs> what's the most unique or an interesting item that you have collected that you think is most memorable? Uh, um, well, you know, I collect a, a lot of stuff, not, you know, some people get in the antiques or they some people have a bucket list of where to travel. And, and so I, I, I don't, I, I mean, you know, I've been fortunate through uh, the FM industry and who I work for to have traveled a lot, not, you know, not nearly as much internationally, but um, that, that might, I, I think that that list is still growing. So to answer your question, I think it would be travel. Mm. And so, uh, I think that's something that, you know, I would like to continue to go to places that I haven't been 
I've only been to a handful of places compared to, to others, but uh, to me, I think understanding, you know, and learning the culture and going to that side of the world uh, is really fascinating to me. Yes, totally. So if you could teleport yourself to any place right now, John, where would you like to go? Wow. Um, <laughs> that's, that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure it's doable, but space. You know, they're, they're talking about trips to, to the moon someday, and uh, they're now, they now have balloons that uh, they're going to take you up there and wine and dine you for a couple hours up at the stratosphere. Uh, so you can see the stars and the curvature of the earth. And um, that would probably, I, I know I couldn't become an astronaut or anything like that, but um, I think space is something I'd be interested in. Oh, that's, that's nice. So uh, have you ever had a funny or an embarrassing or a interesting moment while doing a presentation or a public speaking engagement? I know you speak a lot. Any kind of sudden hiccups, obstacles, challenges, funny incidents come to you? <laughs> no, I was, well, I was younger and I was uh, uh, in front of, uh, I was in my thirties and I was managing very large, as you know, the portfolio in, uh, in aerospace. And I had to go to the corporate headquarters to present you know, our facility management program in front of the chairman and, and all the executive VPs and whatnot. And, and back then it was view graphs. I don't think if, if you remember the days of view graph, you know, we didn't have computers and whatnot. It's this big machine, you put it up and it puts up on the screen. And, and I'm doing a presentation and all of a sudden I'm going like this. I'm scratching my eyes like, what's, what the, you know, there's a bulge in my, in, in my sleeve here, you know, in uh, the shirt. And, and, and uh, you know, some of the people notice, and, and so I, you know, I was do, fud, fiddling with this, and then I pulled out a, a baby sock. <laughs> and I was, I was, I was uh, sorry, sorry about that. It's, it's, <laughs> my, my wife was washing my clothes with a, with a baby sock, so I was pulling out a couple of baby socks. <laughs> but back then, you know, it, it was like, no one laughed. I mean, that, those were the days where all suits and ties and, uh, you know, it was, um, as, it was in aerospace and, and so it was, you know, quite serious and it, was, it wasn't a problem, but, but, you know, I felt real embarrassed. Now today it'd be a good laugh, but <laughs> totally, totally. the world, the world has changed. Yes. Yes. That's so true. So, uh, if you could, thanks for sharing that, John, if you could have a dinner with any historical figure. Who would you choose to have dinner to? And if you are cooking the meal, what would you cook for them? Well, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, my, my, I have an interest in, you know, the sp in space and uh, astrophysics. Uh, probably Albert Einstein. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, I mean, I would imagine that he can talk above uh, one of the quotes from Einstein, which which I thought was a, a credit to his, to his humility, was someone had asked him, uh, "How did you become the smartest man in the world? Mm. You know, how come you're so smart?" And he says, "I'm just like you." Mm. He says, "It's not that I'm very smart. I just know where know where to get the answers." Now that was a pretty humbling thing but uh you know um and his uh, relativity his theory of relativity and 18 different dimensions mathematically you know and this whole black hole notion that's now been proven out which was one of his theories and such i, I think it'd be incredible to you know talk to such an individual and you know i probably would pretty much keep it simple you know um um uh, you know barbecue steak and, and <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing elaborate. I'm, you know, I'm sure it's some of these great world leaders have, have had that. Yes, have had quite, uh, quite the meal across the world. Yes, that, that, that's nice. I mean, like, why not? A barbecue steak and talk about cost, cosmic energy and space and uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's that's the, 
it's so nice. That's nice. So, uh, so if you could design a space dedicated to your favorite hobby or interest, what would you do, and what features would be there in that specific space? Um, well, actually being, being out here on the ranch, uh, I'm in the process of developing a space for, uh, for the grandkids and, you know, soon to be, you know, probably great grandkids. So you know, kind of a Western town, you know, with, uh, you know, with the, uh, a, a player a playground area and maybe a you know play play set wagon wagon train and a, a, you know the spin wheels th things like that you know uh, so um, yeah I'm, I'm thinking about creating a, a, just an area so you know as you walk out to the back and you know that it'll be like a little western town for the kids which sometimes we do for the kids like we do for ourselves right yeah, I mean, that was something I, I really I was really interested in as a kid and um, didn't have the wherewithal to, you know, go places like that. So, uh, I, you know, I would probably build it not only for the kids, but for myself. <laughs> so that that's probably a two year project that I'm now now that I'm retired, I can I can do something like that. Nice, nice. you know, nice windmill that they can get up on stuff like that. Totally, totally. I mean, like, definitely it will be working fine, um, Sean. And if I do cross the area, I will come and play with you in your adventure park. That you yeah, you have to come. <laughs> yeah, okay. come, come out to, come out this way. It gets playing hot during the summer. Yeah, we'll, we'll take a dip in the pool. Totally, <laughs> totally, John. Thank you. John, let's let's look back. You know, a successful career from where you started. You know, polytechnic basketball moved on to do, you know, industrial engineering, architecture, you know, a lot of tech-based property, huge portfolios, IFMA, Global FM, you name it, AFE, ISO. Talk us through the people in your life. Who are the people who have been the most influential in your life and career? Well, I, you know, I think it, it's twofold. It's your family, uh, mm. number one. Uh, but But also, it's the constituents and, and the good friends that you meet along the way of your career. That's part of wanting to give back. And there, and and you know, I do think of uh, and and I've traveled a lot, and I know my my kids and especially my grandkids. They, they love to hear my stories. Of, you know, people that I've met and where I've been and what I've seen and whatnot. And uh, and so to me. Uh, you know, sharing that and, uh, you know, is exciting to, to me. Uh, and, and those, there's some, I met some really incredible people along the way. I've learned from a lot of them. And every facet of what you do in life uh, and your profession, you meet a subject matter expert and you'll learn from them and it makes you better. But the one quality that you, you is, you know, they say people are born with leadership skills. Well, that's only partially true. It's really what you do to enhance it. Because mm. uh, all people can be a leader. But to be the most effective leader, uh, I, I think we, we, uh, we learn from each other. And some of the, when I was a, a young person, I can, I can remember being a young person out of college and having these big jobs and doing this. And I'm thinking, God, I'm the youngest person here. You know, I, I, I thought it was going to be like that forever. Well, guess what? It's not. <laughs> here I am 45 years later. But um, it's the lessons you learn um, working with people. And, and uh, a lot of them become your good friends. Yes, totally. That totally. So is there any person you haven't met for a long time and you hope that they're doing okay? Would you like to get in touch straight after this podcast? <laughs> oh, I don't know. That's a, that's a, uh... yeah, there probably are. I, I can't really think of someone off the, the top of my head, though, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, Facebook and Ancestry, uh, the connections you make doing ancestry research, I have met some people 
that, uh, you know, um, that I thought I would never meet and which has allowed me to, to get pictures of my ancestry and whatnot. So uh, to me, I think, you know, I love to meet a lot of acquaintances that I've worked with, but um, getting a photo of my great, great grandfather or something that, you know, I, I, I've never seen by making a connection with someone through, through ancestry research uh, to me is, um, is pretty exciting. Yes. That's nice. That's nice. I mean, like, so uh, what are some of the key lessons you have learned through your career that you would like to pass on to the next generation of professionals? Well, I think one of them is, is uh, as I mentioned, getting into the workplace uh, is, is your attitude mm. uh, to... Uh, it's not so much an attitude, but it's uh, as being very open-minded to say, I'm here to learn and uh, I don't have any biases and, uh, and and you've got to be, uh, you know, truthful to yourself that, you know, you get out of school, you learn a little bit, or you did one project and, you know, you think you're a subject matter expert. I can tell you, you can go in the room and that ain't going to be the case. And the next time around, that person's not going to help you out. Mm. So especially younger in your career and even older in your career, uh, you know, just being open-minded. Uh, though sometimes my kids say, Dad, you already made up your mind. But I said, well, that's just with you guys. <laughs> but in the workplace, um, I think that's a key attribute. To, to have good listening skills. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the other thing uh, that comes with that to, to have good listening skills and, and approach a project and apply yourself is um, creating the relationships with people. You know, I know when I went to architecture school, we had jokes about the engineers and engineers had jokes about the architects and we, we kid each other like, you know, uh, architects cover their mistakes and you know we say well engineers bury their mistakes and <laughs> but but the fact of the matter is um, um through life you know with your family but uh, also you know talking about your career you run across people that uh you're going to run across again and so you know don't burn bridges it's it's important to to to, to keep, have a positive attitude about that uh, with people that you meet. So I, and I think that's a, another strong attribute of, uh, and, and as a result of that, you know, um, you know, those are some of the key, key things that I think, think are important in life, being open-minded and uh, having good listening skills and, and, um, you know, that during the course of uh, on-the-job training or, you know, enhancing your leadership skills, a lot of companies do that from decade to decade. They bring in these different programs and, and they compare you with certain leaders and they're saying, well, you need to be more adaptable or because of your position, you need to be more ideal. And because of your posi this position, you need to be more demanding. And... Um, but they don't do that anymore. <laughs> I think that was just a way to, to try to bring leadership, leadership skills to people. Um, and, and, and so, uh, you know, I, it's just, it's just about human interaction and treating people like uh, you're treating them as you want to be treated, you know, whether it's your family and, or, you know, your, you have fun with best friends hanging out or uh, playing sports and or, you know, in your job site. So, you know, just uh, being open. Nice. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was helpful. Last question, John. I know 45 plus years of careers. What are some of the most rewarding aspects of being a facilities management professional? And what motivates you to continue making a difference in this field? Uh, you know, uh, the, the challenge of facility management, there's no two days alike. And um, 
and uh, be because we're we're so vast in all the other occupations that we we deal with. I mean, just recently here in the United States, uh, facility management finally, after maybe eight years ago or ten years ago, got their own occupation code. You know, we were we used to be lumped into the construction. We be used to be lumped into to uh, you know engineering and and uh, and the reason for that is we represent a whole array of the community of you know uh, of uh, people that are part of the FM organization, from real estate people to brokers to developers to. Uh, landowners to you know construction and architecture and and the full array of of, of what goes on. So um, because of that, there's so much to learn. I mean, there's not many people who will say, oh, "I've been doing this job for ten years and I'm bored." You know, and um, I'll, I'll sometimes hear facility managers say, "Oh man, I'm stressed. I can't handle this job. There's too many things to do." Okay, well, that's good, but you'll never hear a facility manager say, I'm bored. <laughs> so, and if you are, you need, need to go find another job. Um, but it's really the challenge. There's, there's so many great challenges and things that I personally accomplished that I thought I would never get involved with. I mean, I mean one perfect example of doing seismic retrofits is uh, at Cal Berkeley, where that's the uh, the center of structural engineering. I had a cadre of uh, engineers that worked for me when we retrofitted, seismically retrofitted this building. And, and as a result of coming out of that, um, we've created uh, processes to stiffen and uh, to, to help stiff buildings, concrete brick, to survive earthquakes. And a lot of those techniques were used by Caltrans, which is the transportation uh, um, department here throughout the United States for freeways. And so we exchange information. And I've seen a lot of uh, structural testing. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, I, I've been involved with a lot of different things like that, which is uh, um, something that if you're in one occupation, you, you may not be privy to all the other things in, in the occupation that you could be involved with. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it, it's a great challenge. And, and I, and I, and, and the reason I'm still here is I, I, you know, I uh, have a lot of good, I mentor a lot of uh, individuals and youngsters and whatnot. And, and uh, though I'm retired and actually most of, my meetings, which is maybe two times a week, three times a week is between the hours of uh, 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. because of meeting people across the world. That seems best. I have to get up at three o'clock in the morning to have four o'clock meeting, but I don't have to do that every day. So, yeah. um, yes. so I do, you know, I do appreciate being able to participate and give back to the industry. Thoughts, Eric. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. John, as we close the episode, is there any part of your life or career that we missed? Or is there anything else you would try to say to the listeners before we end? No, no, but I, I do want to thank you, sir, for uh, this opportunity because, uh, you know, you, you get a presentation, you go here, you go there, and, and people don't really get to, to meet you or know you. Mm. And and I think uh, this podcast and what what you've done to to really uh, understand you know uh, how how to be successful. I'm not saying uh, you know extremely successful, but you know I, I've done well. Uh, and to share uh, some of the basic concepts of you know what's important to me, characteristics mm. uh, you know of of life can pertain to being successful in the industry. And I think uh, having this conversation has been uh, actually very enjoyable. So I, I thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Wish you, your family, everybody, all the happiness and success and continue to inspire us, continue to stay healthy. Good luck with all your hobbies and projects and stuff. And I'll definitely hope to see you in one of the IFMA conference or Global FM events in the coming days. Thank you so much, John. Very good. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Thank you so much, sir.